We are now ready to move into our second part of the micro lab. In part two of the micro lab, instead of focusing on looking at the microbes under the microscope and getting characteristics that way, we are now going to be introducing the microbes into different types of media. The media are going to contain certain things that will allow us to determine can a bacteria use whatever we've put in that media. As we go through the next few weeks, we'll be talking about different types of utilization media and selective media. Oftentimes, the media will actually be both utilization and selective, but we're going to start with some of the simpler ones. A utilization media is a media that contains some sort of component. And in this media, we can test whether or not the microbe we inoculate can use that component. When we first start talking about this, many students at first are a little confused because as humans, we can use pretty much anything. Well, all microbes aren't like that. And to give you something that's sort of human to relate this to, not all humans can use the same components for energy as well as others. For example, if you've ever heard of someone being lactose intolerant, that means that that person can use sugars to produce energy for food, but for some reason they lack the ability to use a specific sugar. And as we go through, we're going to see that microbes have kind of the same sort of characteristics as a person that may be lactose intolerant. There may be microbes that can't use lactose as a sugar source for survival. So if you use a utilization media that contains only lactose and you put bacteria in there, they can't use the lactose, so they're going to die. As we go next week and into the following week, we'll be doing some selective media. Selective media allow you to select between one type of microbe and another. For example, only gram positives may grow on the media, or only gram negatives may grow, or only halophiles will grow, or, and so on and so forth. We'll do some of those as we get into the next week. Our first media we're going to discuss today is called phenol red broth. Just from the name of phenol red broth, you should be able to conclude it's obviously going to be red. It's got phenol red in it. And it's a broth, so it's going to be a liquid. Phenol red is actually a pH indicator. It is simply a color we can add to the media. At higher pHs, the media turns red and pink. At lower pHs, the media turns yellow. Just this pH indicator can't tell us anything about the bacteria. But what we can do is couple this color change to some sort of fermentation or metabolism in, with the bacteria. In the phenol red broth, we add some sort of sugar. The example that's on this page is glucose. But we actually add glucose, sucrose, fructose, lactose, lots of different sugars. But the key is we only add one sugar at a time. So we're testing to see can the bacteria use the specific sugar that's there. If you recall from our lecture class, we learned what happens when a bacteria is allowed to ferment a sugar. The sugar, and we usually talk about glucose in class, is converted by glycolysis into pyruvate. And then the pyruvate is further converted into something like lactic acid or ethanol. As the glucose is broken down, you will see a decrease in the pH because the glucose is turned into the lactic acid or the ethanol. Since we've added the phenol red pH indicator, we can follow visually is the pH of the solution going down. So when we look at these media, they're going to start out red. If we add a bacteria that cannot use the sugar, it will stay red. If we add a bacteria that can use the sugar, it's going to convert the sugar into lactic acid. The pH of the media will start to decrease, and you start seeing the color change from red to orange, to light orange, to yellow. In our example at the top, I've showed you what happens when you add specific bacteria into the phenol red broth. This one here, E. coli, has been added to the broth. 24 hours later, it turned yellow. Therefore, we can look at this and understand that E. coli can use lactose. In this tube, I added Micrococcus luteus. 24 hours later, it was still red. No color change. So the bacteria was not using the sugar. 
We also add a second component to the media, and that's called a Durham tube. You may have noticed this in the previous pictures. The Durham tube is a very small upside down test tube inside of your large test tube. The upside down test tube acts to detect gas production. If you recall when we covered fermentation in lecture, we learned that many times carbon dioxide is a byproduct of fermentation. Sometimes as a bacteria is breaking down the sugar, it produces a gas. If gases are made in the liquid, it becomes an air bubble. The upside down Durham tube allows the air bubbles to get trapped so you can see them when you come back the next day. So if we go back to our original pictures, we can look at what's going on in tubes A, B, C, and D. In tube A, it's still red, no sugar use. Tube B and tube C, they're starting to turn orange. That means the bacteria is trying to use the sugar. The pH has gone down slightly. In tube D, we see it is yellow, so the bacteria is using the sugar, and we see a gas bubble. So this bacteria is using the sugar and producing gas. Our second media for the day is urea broth. From the name, you can surmise that urea broth is obviously a liquid, and it must contain urea. This media allows us to test for a bacteri bacteria's ability to use urea as a food source. In this media, we do not give any sugar to the bacteria. We are now testing to see, can the bacteria break down some sort of protein component? In order to do so, a very rare enzyme called urease must be present in the bacteria. If you add a bacteria to the media, and it stays the original yellow color, then that bacteria has not used urea. Urea broth contains phenyl red pH indicator. As we learned a minute ago, at the yellow color, phenyl red is at low pH. With urea broth, we're looking for a change from the low pH of yellow to a very high pH of hot pink. The reason we can do this is during the metabolism of urea, as urea is converted into a breakdown product to produce energy, an ammonia byproduct is produced. Ammonia has a very high pH. Looking at these tubes, we can see the two possible results. The E. coli is added to urea. When checked 24 hours later, the media is still yellow. We had no pH change because the E. coli did not use the urea. If we look at the Proteus mirabilis tube, the bacteria was added, and 24 hours later, we see a hot pink color. In this tube, the Proteus mirabilis began to break down the urea, releasing the ammonia byproduct. The ammonia byproduct caused an increase in pH and the yellow color, the pink color to form. Our last media for the day is citrate media. Citrate media, the name tells us this is not a broth, it is a media. It's actually going to be a slant. Citrate tells us that we are giving the bacteria citrate as a source of sugar to break down. The breakdown of citrate is similar to urea in that an ammonia byproduct is produced. Since we're looking at similar metabolic pathways, we do not want to use the phenyl red pH indicator. For this one, we add a different pH indicator called bromothymol blue. Bromothymol blue is green at low pH and blue at high pH. When we look at the test tubes, you should see that this one on the right is green. This is the original color of the media. If I add bacteria to the media and it stays green, that tells me that that bacteria cannot use the citrate. If I add bacteria to the media and it turns bright blue, that means the bacteria can use the citrate, releasing the ammonia byproduct, causing an increase in pH, so you get the blue color.